<laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we'll just kind of jump in here. So um, I'm just going to start out talk a little bit about the differences between reptiles and amphibians, just to give you a little bit of a picture of how different they are. So reptiles are slow to mature. Uh, the turtle in this picture uh, is a Blanding's turtle. Takes 17 to 20 plus years to reach maturity. The spring peeper uh, can uh, reproduce a year after it's transformed into a frog, do a little bit more nesting the next year, the quantity of eggs, but very different that way. Uh, low productive uh, potential. Blandings typically lay kind of an average of 10 to 11 eggs. They can lay more or lay less depending on what's going on in their own system. And the uh, peepers, uh, they'll produce maybe in their first year about 100 eggs, but after that they'll produce about 200 eggs. So very different from that perspective. Large home ranges, uh, Blanding's turtles are wanderers. They'll usually overwinter in either a river or a deeper part of a lake. And in the spring, they will bolt out of there as soon as it starts to get warm. When the edges of the ice open up, they're out. And they're moving to a pond that's much smaller and shallower that'll be thawed. So that it's kind of the, the correlation between the lake melting and the pond has been open for a while and warming up. Um, and so they'll cover a lot of territory. Some of the telemetry store telemetry studies show a lot of distance that's traveled from one area to another by that creature during the whole season. Peepers generally live within about 300 feet of the breeding wetland they're a part of. And peepers tend to be a forestry, forested uh, habitat creature. And Blanding's obviously like being more out in the open. They're even in marshes or they're, uh, they're nesting out in, in open mostly sandy habitat if they can find it. So here's some common species we'll talk about today. I'll go through them a little bit individually, but I put this picture in here that a friend sent me. Those are two painted turtles. Uh, the painted turtles are probably a blend between the western and the eastern. One of them has a gorgeous plaster on bottom, and the, the eastern has a plain bottom. So if you look at the belly of uh, most of these animals, you'll see that there's some variability depending on where you are in the state. Um, but in between there is a snapper smiling at you guys. Um, and you can see the shell with all the moss on it. I just thought this is one of the cutest pictures I've seen, so threw it in there. And these are habitat generalists. Uh, just They're not very fussy about what they have. It could be maybe your backyard swimming pool if you're not looking. So this is a painted turtle, um, very pretty carapace. The top shell is called a carapace. Females usually uh, start to breed in five to seven years. They lay clutches of six to 13 eggs. In, uh, in southern Wisconsin, they may double clutch. So they'll usually lay an egg uh, clutch in late May or early June, and then they may do another one in July. But a much smaller percentage of them does the double clutching. A lot of it has to do with their fitness. This is a snapping turtle. It's in the process of laying its eggs. Um, just uh, kind of love seeing those uh, occur. Unfortunately, you see a lot of them nesting along the sides of roads. And, uh, you know, I just think, well, is that female going to make it across the road when she's done? And how are those little babies that walk a lot slower going to move? And this turtle will lay uh, about 30 to 50 eggs. The record is 83. Um, I don't think I want to carry that load. <laughs> anyway, um, so the females mature in about seven to nine years at about eight and a half to nine inches, and the males are a little bit smaller uh, when they mature. We have two species of soft shells in Wisconsin. One of them is called the spiny soft shell, which is shown here. 
The other one is a smooth soft shell, and I could not find my slides for that to put in this. Uh, they're very different looking. So you notice the female has a pretty dark uh, carapace, the top shell. And one of the things that uh, distinguishes the, the smooth from the spiny, if you look at the female and you look at the front edge of her shell, you'll see these little spikes sticking out. And that's how it got the name spiny. So they're pretty easy if you, if you see one. Uh, they're like lightning on land. So you don't usually get to see them very well. But if somebody accidentally catches one on a fishing line, you could probably just look at that ridge and see if it's a, if it's a big turtle, it's a female. So this very big size difference. So the largest male I've ever seen, and that was in Tennessee, was about... Uh, nine inches in shell length. Most of the males are about somewhere like that and that. And the females, you know, they can get really big. I've seen them close to 20 inch shell length. So they're, they're a husky animal. And they lay uh, usually about 20 to 28 eggs. That's kind of typical. This is a Wachita map turtle, which is a riverine species, and it primarily lives in bigger rivers. So they're in the Mississippi, Wisconsin, the, uh, the Black River, and then the, uh, trying to think of the river up, Chippewa River. Those, I mean, it's not, they're not restricted to that. Sometimes you'll see them, especially when they're smaller, going up tributaries, but they're generally a big, big river species. Um, and they have a very serrated back edge of the shell, uh, somewhat like a snapper, but this is a really firm shell, uh, kind of almost sharp edges on it. And then you'll see this black uh, dots that are along the, the vertebrae there on the outside. If this animal had its head further out, you'd see a crest on the side um, that would also give it a little more character. It's, it's pretty nice. Critter. So there's two others. The common map turtle um, is actually bigger than this one. It can get up to about nine inches in length. It's fairly wide. The females are a lot bigger again than the males. Um, the males of this species here usually get to be about this big and the female is about like that. So on the other species you may have a really large turtle and a very small male. How that's convenient, I don't know, but it's what works out there in nature. <laughs> and then the, the other one is called a false map turtle. It's very rare in this state, but interestingly in Minnesota, it's a common species and the Wachita map turtle is a, a watch species, meaning it's, they're not doing as well there. We can't explain why that is, but, uh, and they look fairly similar. Uh, you'd have to look at the bottom of a hatchling of both of them to kind of tell which is what, which is which, because it gets real blurry when you when they start growing. And again, uh, another fast water species. This is uh, one of my favorite photos. Um, this is a Blanding's turtle. They have a lot of variation in their shell markings, so this one happens to be hyper spotted which is why I like it. The, uh, when they get mature, you'll notice on this next picture, that bright yellow throat. It starts to get yellow when they're kind of a sub-adult, but then it just becomes brilliant. And it's, it's unmistakable. So oftentimes if, you, if you're looking in a, let's say in a marsh and you see this yellow throat on there, it could be a Blanding's turtle, but it also could be a male bullfrog. And from a distance, unless you had something to magnify it, you probably couldn't be sure what it is. And Blanding's uh, are, they used to be a threatened species. They were downlisted uh, primarily for political reasons to get that animal off the get out of my way kind of a thing. That's, uh, I worked for the DNR for 19 years and I saw a lot of this, it was painful. <laughs> this is the ornate box turtle. There's a male and a female. Now their colors can vary on top, so it doesn't really say anything. The difference generally with, 
the males, center of their eye is red in an adult, and the females are just kind of brown. So that's the easiest way to tell them apart. However, I was in southern Illinois a uh, week before last, and I found an eastern box turtle, which is another terrestrial species, had red eyes, but when I picked her up and looked at her bottom, it was a female. So I thought she was cheating, but I can't do anything about it. Anyway, these are endangered here. Um, so this is an animal that is so rare here, it's only found in seven locations in southern Wisconsin. And all of those are highly isolated from one another. The sad part about that is you can't really do anything genetic-wise to kind of keep things healthy. So you kind of get this inbreeding within a population. Um, we've never tried moving one to another. Uh, if we did, we'd do it with the closest populations, but that's not in my hands anymore. So I don't know if that'll happen down the road, but we do a lot of work to try to preserve their habitat. But we also, um, uh, in addition to doing habitat management, we have done some kind of dramatic different things because it's in trouble. So this is a picture, this little guy down here is three centimeters in length. It's just a baby coming out of the egg. And this is a head started turtle that started at three gram or three centimeters and is now 8.1 centimeters. And it's uh, grown significantly uh, 9.6 grams to 102. That's kind of an average for the head starting we did. That bigger turtle in 11 months is equivalent to a six-year-old wild ornate box turtle. So what we were trying to do is to figure out a way we could get more adults on the population more quickly because while we're waiting for an animal to take umpteen years to get to maturity, um, we're hoping to shrink that by getting these animals well fed in an 11 month period. So how does the head starting work? What we do is we take eggs that we find in the wild, or sometimes we would uh, use oxytocin to get them to lay their eggs when we knew they were developed inside. We'd get the eggs, we'd incubate them, we'd hatch them, and we would raise them for 11 months, and we would pound them with food. So we were trying to get them big. So this little guy here, his plastron, and I can't really show you this unless I had a picture model, they have a hinge on the bottom that allows them to close the back and the front of the shell like a tight as can be and you can hardly get it open. It, but that takes five years for that to form in the wild. And, and they're a little smaller turtle, they're weaker. These guys develop a hinge during this 11 month period because they're growing so fast. And it's a solid hinge that you can't mess with. You can't get at it with your claws. So, there's an advantage to doing this, but there's also some disadvantage to doing it. Um, I won't go into the disadvantage. It's that um, I'll, I'll talk maybe a little bit about it in, in a minute. So we had one site that the uh, utility company um, We Energies owned. Uh, they were going to be building a dam on another dam on the river, and that all got poo-pooed. So the DNR offered to buy this property, but we were working with the utility company for several years trying to get this site in really good shape that would be good habitat for them. And over the years, from 1993 to 2008, we produced uh, on this site uh, just under 350 individual turtles that we had reared and raised. So they, were, they had hinges and they were kind of a lot quicker to maturing. Uh, overall, we had started uh, over 1,100 of these turtles, and we put some at all of the other sites. So um, 
this site is one of the seven, this experimental site. Uh, it's all got good habitat now. Um, and it's, it's desert-like, it's sandy soil. So that's, that's what we were able to do with this, with this species. Now, they're not safe because of this isolation issue. There's potential for genetics to enter into this thing that could be a downfall. This is the wood turtle, and this is where I'm going to kind of change over to uh, what I'm doing right now. Uh, so the wood turtle uh, is named by its annual growth ring. So if you look at the carapace, you'll see those little ridges there. It's like a cross section of a tree, and that's how I got the name wood turtle. They also like to live in forests. They're a semi-terrestrial animal, so they like fast moving rivers and that thing. Uh, turtle gets, uh, males get about that large, females about like that. They take, um, males will mature in about 12 to 15 years. Females, uh, uh, maybe 15 to 20 plus. There's kind of a range there. Females just tend to grow a little slower. I don't know why that is. So, these turtles typically nest annually. Uh, there's a uh, number of clutches uh, is uh, usually six to 15. The record in the state is 21. I've never seen one that big. Um, I also question that because um, I was at a site one day where this was before we'd started this program. We we're just beginning to take this, tackle this problem with this wood turtle. and. Uh, I came to a little spot in an old quarry, and there were two areas about that big around, about seven feet apart, and I could see a nest polish in there. Uh, hmm, that's interesting. So I started to dig down, and before I got a half inch underground, I broke an egg. And I was like, what? So what I ended up doing is set that one aside, and I just carefully took them out. 11 clutches and they had been just laid so they were they had no whiting on them they turned white like a chicken egg over a few days i got down to that clutch and i put it off to one side and then there was another clutch below it so it'd be fairly easy for somebody to possibly have that turtle laying 21 eggs could very well have been two clutches can't really say but uh, and they, they nest annually uh, that's, that's just kind of a standard for most of the turtles here in Wisconsin. This is a picture of a male. It's the plastron, and it's concave. And uh, they're very aggressive breeders, and their shell bottom is designed so that it'll hit the ridge on the female. And with his four legs, he'll just lock her in place. And then he'll do whatever a male does to get her to cooperate it's i don't think they do that eagerly uh i'm talking about the females here it just seems like a brutal um sometimes you'll see them stretch out their neck and bite at her head and she has to pull her head in which makes her back end a little more vulnerable this is, sounds a little crude but this is what happens out there <laughs> anyway they successfully breed her he goes away she just ate her eggs and the rest is good. <laughs> so they like tannin stained rivers. We learned that interestingly through a bunch of surveys we did. Um, why they don't live in clear water, we are unsure of. We've got a couple of rivers that just look like beautiful habitat, you know, in the riparian areas, but the water is clear. Never found a wood turtle in there. Get tan and stained, that's what they love. So there's got to be a benefit somehow there. We just don't know what that benefit is. What's that? I think better tannin, they would be able to hide better. Well, yeah, they, but all the other turtles use these other rivers too. This is the only one that uses the tannin only. Um, we will find snappers in the same habitat. We see some painteds, but... Most of the painteds and most of the rivers here are forested, 
So painids are usually looking for open canopy habitat where they can bask better. And that helps them to be able to produce two clutches if they're mature enough to do that. So it's still kind of remained an entry, but yeah, they, they do blend into the bottom a lot better. So this is a picture of what the typical riverside habitat is in the riparian area just off the creek. The creek is just a little bit, uh, maybe 10 feet further to the, uh, right, to the right. This is the habitat in the spring when these turtles just bail out when it's finally getting like in the upper 40s or 50s. They'll come out and they'll bask for as long as they can because the water is warming up much, much slower than the air. And this is prime habitat. Uh, lots of uh, ferns, a lot of alder brush. We have a problem uh, on some of the uh, rivers that are uh, in northwestern and northeastern Wisconsin. They've been designated as national rivers uh, where you can't touch the landscape within 150 feet of the water. The problem is that eventually this will move from open canopy like right here It'll become all brushy and eventually it'll be taken over by forest and they're going to lose their ability to thermoregulate in the spring. So they're going to have to go somewhere and up north they're in a whole lot of somewheres to go to find openings. So they'll oftentimes they'll use, like there's a spot up on one of our sites where there's a long, long gravel road we follow in and, and it comes to a little uh, opening where you can park a few cars and you can turn around a vehicle besides that so it gets a little more sun the turtles try to nest in there the problem is that we've compacted the soil so much they can't lay their eggs so it's it's kind of a mess and we wish there was a little bit more flexibility for preserving a rare species in a wild river designated wild river so that we could keep that habitat uh, flourishing for them This is a, uh, just a picture of a field up in northern Wisconsin that is fairly sandy, and you can see that there is a lot of exposed sand. You can see how brushy it is around there, it vegetated, I should say, not brushy, but a lot of vegetation. This is where the wood turtle would prefer to nest, is in open, sandy areas. The problem is these are very few and far between, and you never find an intact nest there. Raccoons get them right away, usually within a day or two, or the same night they're laying. So um, in natural succession, if you think about northern Wisconsin, there was a period when a lot of that land up there was cleared de decades ago. Now it's becoming very overgrown. So the only places these turtles usually have to nest is road shoulders or on gravel roads. Well, you can see the downside to that. And raccoons walk the road shoulders and dig up every nest. It's just an automatic behavior every year. So we're trying to address that issue. So this is a picture of a quarry that uh, is quite large. And we went in there to look at that and we found an area, I think I got a different photo of this. Nope. I don't know if I missed something here. I thought I had another slide in there. Anyway, this there's a little area here of about 50 square feet. That was the only place everything else had grown in. So we went in there, and maybe it'll come up in the second slide down the road. Uh, we bulldozed the whole thing, refreshed it, got rid of everything. And we thought, oh boy, this is going to spread the nesting out. The predators aren't going to have much success. Well, that just didn't work out. Well, how did I lose? Maybe it'll come up. Pardon me. Anyway, I'm going to move on. If I come back to it with the slides, they were all in here at the first time I put this together, so I don't think they disappeared. <laughs> but um, we have a real serious issue here with... Uh, wood turtle mortality because they come along the roads to lay their nests. And if you watch some of these turtles, they'll go to one side of the road, they'll dig, they'll move down, dig a little bit more, eh, I'll cross the road over here, dig a little bit more. Well, in the meanwhile, cars are flying by and 
There's people that aim for them and there are people that intentionally avoid them. But you find road kills more frequently than you wish. Uh, it's just kind of a sad issue here. There's a Blanding's turtle that had eggs in it that had just been hit on a road. This was down in southern Wisconsin. Same, same thing. Just somebody thought it'd be fun to kill something. Here's a female that's actually laying her eggs on the shoulder of a road. You can see the egg just came out of her tail end, and she's she'll move it, shape it down in there, and then she'll bring some soil in there to try to get it protected. And she'll just keep that process up until she's finished with her clutch, and then she'll polish off the whole top. And we'll see a little bit about that later. So we got big issues with uh, road kills. We've also got terrible issues with nest predation. So before I started this work, um, we had a lot of contact with a lot of people in northern Wisconsin where this turtle specifically lives. It's, we, we work in the, like the top third of the state. And you would, you would just hear about every, every turtle that lays an egg, uh, within two days it's, it's eaten, oftentimes the first night. They'll typically nest in the late afternoon or maybe in the early morning if they tried to nest last night and they got kicked off the next morning. They're coming to lay it early just to get it out because it's ready to go. Most of them lay in the evening, and you know then they, we wondered for a long time, how the heck did these predators find them so easily? So a friend of mine did some experiments, and he found out that they were not, and this, this contradicted all the prior literature on turtle predation. They felt that predators were using their eyes to find sites, find polishes. Well, this friend of mine did a study where he was really digging deep for results. What is going on here? And so he had these stations where they could predate and then he had this electric fence set up. We haven't gotten into that yet, but to keep predators out. And uh, what he would do is to, uh, he did a bunch of experiments with uh, different things. He'd dig a hole, he'd put nothing in the hole, he'd just backfill it. And he would then sometimes put a chicken egg in one, or he'd do a variety of things. He was trying to test a whole bunch of different methods, and he was able to come out with eventually with a very, very clear result is it's the subsoil at the bottom of the nest that's dug out, the soil that she brings up to the surface to clear so she can deposit her eggs. There's a scent called geosmin in the soil and raccoons pick a nut like it's a magnet, like it's a bright light in the, in the night. <laughs> They're right there. He's watched it over and over. Three years of telemetry work at two sites with four cameras at each site. He actually had 16 cameras working in because he, he had the nest site and then he had the other one next to it just to kind of compare. And he was able to prove, and he actually published on it, some guys that were reviewing it were not very happy with the results, but they finally accepted the fact that they thought it was by sight. And he was able to prove it wasn't the turtle eggs in the ground either. It was the subsoil that was the key. So that was a real interesting find. So there's things we can do now if we come onto a nest, we can lay a new soil over that to kind of seal off the geosmin and it can work. A friend of mine also uh, experimented with uh, putting a bunch of pine needles over a fresh nest and the pine needle scent seems to have been a detraction as well. So we'll just kind of work through this and hopefully we'll get better at it. But very interesting stuff. So those are your primary three predators. And raccoons are by far the, the worst. They're, they're the more abundant for sure. So if you ever came onto a site that had a bunch of eggs on the surface, that doesn't mean that nest hatched because the egg shells always stay underground. And these little turtles create a little channel it's about this wide and about like that. And they pop up. The first one does all the work and the others follow it. And when they come out, 
that hole, and if you go there like within the next day, or even three or four days later, or even six months later, they haven't had a pounding rain, those holes still exist. And so that's how we determine what's going on in every nest that we see that hatches. And there's a lot of them this year that didn't hatch at all. We had a second worst year ever because of the drought. The drought was terrible in northwestern Wisconsin. It's terrible down here. Um, and we think a lot of turtles, well, we've seen a lot of dead turtles dead in the egg, partially developed, and we just think they desiccated right in the egg. So that was, that was sad, but nature does that. You know, we have good years and we have bad years. So if you see them on the surface, a predator has brought them up. They don't get there on their own when they're laying at the bottom of the nest. So that's, that's a telltale sign if you've got issues. And along roadsides is kind of the biggest issue. So like we did with the, uh, the ornate box turtles, uh, we decided to start a program of head starting for wood turtles because we knew that nothing was happening up there. We didn't have nest predation with the ornate box turtles that wasn't our biggest threat. Our biggest threat was what's genetics going to be like down the road if they just keep interbreeding. Um, but these guys, um, we, just, uh, we, we just knew that if we wanted to try to bolster populations, we're going to have to do the same head starting program. So this is a nickel. The turtle is about the size of a quarter since this is a hatchling. This is a head started turtle. It's just under five inches in shell length. Now, in the next picture, this is that big one right here in the middle, kind of a light colored shell. That was a batch that a friend of mine reared, and they were all over four inches in size. So there's a huge advantage to them being older and having a lot more armor to protect themselves, where a hatching would be just a munch by a skunk or something. Um, these have much more of uh, durability. And we, have, we don't focus on this when we have released these. We did uh, over 1,500 of these. And we don't have the time because of the other work we're doing to, to do population surveys. Occasionally we'll run into one. There was one place uh, where we found a turtle and uh, over a four year period of time, we found it on this back road that was very poorly traveled three years uh, in a row and it just kept getting bigger and bigger but then the last time it was killed by a car you're we just like ah so okay so the other thing we want to do is to work on restoring habitats because we need to create more opportunities we've got 30 sites right now that we manage across the northern part of the state. And there's just usually two, if we're lucky, we get a third person to do all that management. We do it three days in the northwest, two days in the northeast. And we've been having trouble finding people who want to spend five days digging up weeds so we can keep these nest sites pure. And uh, it's well, I can tell you, because I've been doing it since the start, it's a pain in the butt. And there aren't a whole lot of people that want to do that kind of work. It's tedious. But we're hoping we can continue to find people to help us out. Um, yes? For European settlements, you know, would flooding create those open habitats? North Woods, I'm trying to think about or as wood turtles expanded the range because of the cutover, and they were found as far as central or southern. Well, I'm trying to figure out what was going on in northern Wisconsin. Europeans were here. Right. I obviously I can't answer that real accurately, but they they've never been found in southern Wisconsin. They've been found in some rivers in central Wisconsin, but they dominate the rivers up north. What they did back then, I can't explain. Um, but we do know, you know, they had some hellacious fires up there that really burned a lot of forested land. 
and that may have been a really big issue but that's not a permanent issue either because those things usually bounce back in just a few years and they're you're going to have small trees growing that are just going to shade things but i would imagine that perhaps in those situations the eggs took a lot longer to hatch because it wasn't as warm as they needed so temperature has a big effect on when things hatch and when don't so if we have a cold summer even down here uh, you know the eggs are in the nest maybe 10 or 15 days longer because they haven't had enough heat to be able to develop fully more quickly like is kind of the normal yes Well, what the sad part is, if you, I'm, I'm 73, when I was a kid, we used to go up north and you'd see very few homes and they were just little cabins. Now, if you go up there, you know, all of these cities are expanding. People are building out in the middle of nowhere as long as it's not in a forest. But even a lot of the forest land, if you look at the maps, there's inholdings all over in the place. So a lot of that's changed in just the time I've been alive and you know, I suspect that, you know, as we go further, further back, we would have had a lot more forest, but these big fires that you can have, uh, and at least locally, I mean, that, that fire that burned the northern part of the state, it burned a lot of forest up there. But again, it's not for a real long period of time. So, uh, you know, we just don't know enough about the history to know why they're, why they are today. But we're just trying to keep them. They're a threatened species. And that was a species that was also at risk of being changed to a special concern species. Fortunately, that hasn't happened yet. But I don't know if I answered your question. That's a toughie. Um, I don't know. I don't know where these turtles would go, or they would have maybe a longer, much longer uh, development stage in the egg before they hatch. And that seems hard to imagine because. They usually don't become active until uh, the end of March or sometime in April. So it, it may not fit. I, I just, you know, we don't have a good picture of that. Yeah. It had to have been a longer hatch rate, I would think. Question? That's a great question. She said, is the temperature, air temperature, affect the sex of the individual? Well, wood turtles are the only exception in the nation. They are not temperature dependent. And that may be to their disadvantage and why they're living up in northern Wisconsin. Um, and they used to be way more abundant. You talk to some of the people from biological supply houses. I've interviewed some of them years ago when I was at the DNR. They were raping the resource. There were so many wood turtles. And they, they found markets all over the world for this. It's the most intelligent turtle in the world can climb a six foot chain link fence they can learn mazes I kid you not they're incredible for a turtle there's just like nothing like it that we know of so so the question was what are they eating and, and how is it affecting things well, they're amazing critters. They have uh, really strong front and rear legs. They have a practice that was discovered in Pennsylvania. We haven't seen it in Wisconsin, but it's be hard to catch it. They do a dance on the surface with their front legs that are supposed to, at least this is what we think, it's supposed to drive worms and night crawlers out of the ground because it's like it's finally raining. They're doing this pattering on the ground and it's like, oh, it's raining. Thing comes up. <laughs> you tell me where that comes from. It's like, how did they figure that out? Uh, I can't answer these questions. You know, they're, they're just mysteries and it's like, wow. They, they have way more abilities than we'll ever understand, I think. We, the more we learn, 
the dumber we are. I mean, really, it's like it just keeps going. And well, they eat vegetation a lot. There's some species that they prefer, real succulent plants where they're getting moisture as well as some protein. Um, but they'll eat anything. They'll eat snails, any kind of bugs. They'll eat carrion. Uh, I've never seen them feeding on a roadkill deer, but I'm sure if there was a fresh one nearby and they knew it was there, they'd probably go start wailing on it. They, they I mean, the stuff in nature adjusts so well and what we do as people and we're supposed to be caring for this creation blah, we are just doing the opposite uh, they're they're just finding ways around our screw-ups but at the same time we're killing a lot of them and we just aren't maintaining populations and that's why we're trying to do some things this head starting we do um, those turtles are probably not as fit and I don't know if we're ever going to have a chance to do this again. The DNR took the program away from me in 2013 um, for no reason that had any logic to it to me. And I, they just, and I had been retired. I retired in uh, 09. And I'd been doing wood turtle work all that time, and then they, they just shut it off. So it, it's frustrating because they don't have the capacity to do the kind of work we're doing. And our work is just to try to get more hatchings out there in hope of eventually improving the adult population. But whether we're successful or not, in the long run, I don't know. Yeah, not, not easy stuff. <laughs> so this is that uh, little spot that we had, about 50 square feet, and we blow that open. And we went back there the next year, and oh my goodness, there are dug up nests all over the place. The whole length of it. Well, now, uh, you see those trees in the background? Those, th this was taken um, in probably, uh, let's see, maybe 2014, I think we created, the, no, 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 I'm, in 2012 we created this site. Well, those trees are now way taller than they were. And the turtles are now limited to an area where the sun's hitting for most of the day. Now, the good thing is the nest site is more than 150 feet from the water, and this is one of these protected sites. We are hoping that we can get the forestry people to agree to push this wall of trees back, kind of put them way behind blocking the sun so we can have better use of that site. But I don't know that uh, if that'll happen. We're doing it on another site right now and, and it seems to be making a difference. We've got a few more trees to take out yet, but it's complicated stuff. <laughs> so this all led us to how are we gonna protect these animals? And a friend of mine, Greg Geller is his name, he did a bunch of experiments with Will a raccoon prefer to go under a wire or over a wire? And he had a, he had a fence set up that the bottom two wires, just like this one you see, they're green. That's just clothesline. The top one is the hot one. So it was interesting. Uh, he did some experiments, and he found out that a raccoon would not want to go under a five-inch fence be easier to go over the top. So he saw this cameras over and over and he had raccoons just, he'd, he'd have them right at the fence in the next picture, he was taking a picture every minute, he'd have a raccoon going backwards through the air, just blown away by uh, 12,000 volts hitting him. And that was, that was some good news. <laughs> so we then modified, this is the first site that we put up and now that site has a hot wire on the bottom. The reason we're doing that is that uh, you can see up here, it's kind of right in the middle, this little tin foil thing. Um, I wish I had a pointer, but that stake that's right there, there's a little bait basket that's wired on there. We've now moved that base, bas base down 
so that it's easier for a skunk to go and smell it and get zapped. Because when a raccoon gets hit, in the study he did, nothing, nothing would touch that fence again. And he had all of these raccoons marked with uh, scissor marks. He got it. I, I had to do a test to prove that it was effective. And so did the research people that were going to publish the paper. Uh, every animal that ever touched that site got zapped, never even tried to touch it again. So they learned. And so we apply that here, and we are having great nesting success in almost all of our sites. But, um, you know, there's, there's still more than, than we could do. But it's, it's, uh, it's been neat. So this next shot, shot here is what we build now. And that is just a flat plane. We bring in a whole bunch of gravel and sand, uh, more sand than gravel. But that gravel, I have a friend who's been doing turtle, wood turtle work for years and years and years and years. And he made a great big sand pile because the, the guy that was uh, sharecropping his land didn't like the fact that he was going out and cutting down the corn five feet away from this nest all the way around it. And he wasn't, it was affecting his yield a little bit because he had so many wood turtles. And so he decided, well, I'll just, I'll try building one. And he built one of sand. And what he found is that um, the turtles went to it immediately, but uh, flies were actually digging into the site and drilling into the eggs. The larva probably did that. And so he'd, he'd have very little or nothing hatch. And he'd dig them up and he'd see that they were infested. So he started putting three quarter inch crushed stone in the mix. Bug problem stopped immediately. So that's what we use. We've got a couple sites that are natural sand where we haven't had that issue yet. Um, but almost all of our sites, you can see the gravel on the surface. Over the years, the gravel kind of surfaces and that's probably to our advantage as well. So, what that is around the edge, that is just black uh, weed fabric. We lay on the ground, and over it, we lay some fencing. It's uh, usually rabbit fencing, and this is what Greg had used. Uh, he wanted to be sure that if the animal wanted to get up on the fence, and he's standing on this wire, which is all connected to the whole unit, <laughs> super fly through the air. So um, that's what we do. And then we. So then you power it up after you. It would crawl over that. Yeah, but they're not touching the electric fence. Oh, so they have to be touching it and. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's why. That's why if a predator is standing on this wire down here. And grounded, grounded, and you got they put their paws up on front and through the air, so they they work really well. We've had a couple of sites where we had periodic issues with skunks; they can get right under there. So we're trying to figure out how to address that. We've done some trapping. I got one on uh, one of our sites. We've got um, one other site that's used to produce ten nests every almost every year. And the uh, last two years, we haven't gotten any. So we're, we're trying real hard to find some way to get rid of that beast. So, so far, we've uh, restored four sites and fenced them. And these are like the natural quarry sites that are already there. We just put the fencing in. And then we have 26 that have been created. So these ones have been created intentionally to get them closer to the river, but above flood stage, even serious flood stage we're above. And they're in, I mean, they're, they're just working beautifully attracting. Wood turtles is about the only thing we see up and especially way up in uh, like by Brule. That, that's the only species we, we usually see which kind of surprises me. But. So, um, so we've got a total of 30 sites, 26 are electric fenced, and four of them are a nest box. A nest box is something that some people in Maryland came up with, and it's uh, the bottom of it's just like what we have, except there's not a wire, 
there's a gap of three and a quarter inches where the turtles can walk into the site and a raccoon can't get in there. Problem is skunks can. Now, we've not ever had a skunk problem at ours, but the DNR has had some with theirs. I was at a site last, uh, last fall and it was, there were eggs laying on the surface, both inside all over the place and the outside. And we're pretty sure it was a skunk. So you just got to find a way to trap them out of there. And skunks don't usually live in high density, so we're hoping to get rid of ours at that one site next year. Uh, we have sites along 14 rivers in Wisconsin and one in Michigan. And 25 of the sites regularly produce wood turtles. And uh, the range from one, one nest to maybe 10, same as females. Um, we just hope to be able to improve that over time. One of the things that's been real interesting is when we build a site for the first time, we set it up and we know that there's been wood turtles in the area. We'll maybe find one or two nests the first year. Then the number starts to grow and grow and grow. And we, I, we don't, I don't know the science on this, but I think that what the, what the females are smelling is the pheromone given off by hatchlings in the nest. And that opening typically stays open until the next spring. So I think, I don't know, I think that the females are coming because those eggs are hatching. I want my eggs to hatch too. Now that's a human way of putting it, but I don't know how to say it any other way. Anyway, so that's, it's been pretty neat. So now we're going to get into how can you come get some help. One of the things uh, you got to learn is how to identify what a turtle nest looks like. So this one here, the one on the left, you see kind of a roughed up area. If you were to look down in that, being out on that site, you'd see claws. The female, when she's done laying her eggs, she's pulling soil back in. She's pulling it from the outside and she's turning like this and she's doing it all the way around. She's patting it down with her bottom. Her plastron is not like that male concave. It's flat and she can just beat that down. And she does that. And if you see something like this on the shoulder of a road or in a sandy or gravelly area, you might try to look to see if there's claw marks. Now those after a rain will disappear, but you can still see the pad. Right behind that polish is a little divot. That was made by a turtle who was test digging. And my guess is it discovered probably a rock underground and moved over a little bit and then used this for her nest. They're, they're pretty good at that. They, they can dig out some rocks that are maybe that big, but anything bigger than that, they just I have seen snappers work around a really big rock. They're, they're, they got very long legs. Anyway, so um, that's what the nest would look like. And along roads is where we have our biggest issues. So and the, the next one here is a snapper nest. So when they walk away from their nest, they leave two big mounds. Like, what a slob. <laughs> You're like putting a red flag out there. Here's one. That little tail, that hole in the middle, sometimes it's just a groove, sometimes it's a hole. That's where the snapper's tail is. And it's piling the stuff over it as it's trying to dig the hole. And the eggs are actually where that blue circle would be. They're actually in front of it underground because they, they, that's kind of how they dig in. Uh, now, you could take that and smooth it over and try to disguise it. The best thing to do then, if you did that, was to get a bunch of material right adjacent to it and spread it over it to try to cut off that geosmin smell that's in the soil. And it can be real effective. Um, so there's a couple of methods you can use depending on what you're uh, comfortable with. This is a piece of two by two foot, uh, half inch mesh. I think it's half inch in this case. 
and uh, the, you center that over the polish and you just stake it to the ground. You don't necessarily have to overdo this, but you want to try to minimize the raccoons being able to get in there. So I kind of overdid this just to show uh, what would be really safe. The issue with that, though, is you can't let it sit there longer than 50 to 60 days because the turtles can't get out of it. You can also cover the screen with a very fine veneer of whatever material is right there to try to disguise anyone from recognizing it as something. So I just covered half of it with gravel just to show how you could do that. And, um, but you want to, if you're going to, if you protect a nest like that, uh, you want to get those things out of there before 60 days. Because if they try to come up, they're going to get pinned. They won't be able to have the energy to really dig off to the side to get out of there. And uh, you can use a, some kind of landmark or you can use a GPS to get an exact coordinate on that site if, you're, if you have one. So this is another uh, method you can use. This is uh, using cedar that's an uh, inch and a half by three quarters of an inch. And you just nail around the edges, the wire, and then you clip out the corners. So there's a, each corner has a gap about an inch and a half wide. And you do that on all four sides. You stake it down, and you then can cover that with landscape fabric, just anything that can be a kind of a clear cover over that. Not clear, but uh, something that will hold uh, sand or gravel above the box so it's not filling it in when you put that on there. So you lay that on there and then you just bury it over with sand. And you can see up in the corner, there's just a start of me filling this in. And you can see the gap that's there. So that's a method you can leave in place until you're sure they're hatched. And when you go to lift that up, you should be able to see, especially with that fabric overhead, that exit hole is gonna be real obvious. So I just want to thank you for attending, and these are, these are the little guys. There's a hatchling wood turtle and an adult female wood. So if you want to learn more about our program, turtlesfortomorrowoneword.org. What's a disadvantage for Head Start? One big one, and that is they've only eaten human prepared food and they aren't getting all of the junk in their system that helps build up their immune system. So I've done a little bit of mini head starting where I hatch some turtles out and I'll get them eating worms and some other things in addition to the regular food to start that growing in their system. But yeah, it's, I kind of wish we had done that all along, but we were so impressed by the growth, we thought one might outweigh the other. But I think when we, we had a study done at one of our innate box turtle sites and comparing by ratio, uh, there, was, there was more illness in the head started than there was in the, in the natural born animals on the site. So that's one thing that, but now, now what we're doing, we did all this head started to just try to get a jump on things. Now we're doing what allows them to come out and they're on their own and they're doing what they do. And that's, so they're gonna get their immune system set up just like any other turtle now. So live and learn, you know, it's, it's kind of, Experimental, but uh, glad we are where we are. <laughs> I've talked a lot about the work up north. So I work at a state natural area out by um, Sauk City, and it's a site that has ornates. And I've been doing habitat. What's that? 
Okay. Yeah, I've been working there, um, I'd say probably 48 weeks a year, um, once or twice, sometimes three times uh, a week, just doing habitat management, but we're doing it for the overall. So we're trying to get rid of exotic stuff, plants in particular, and we're trying to manage, uh, there's a lot of oak trees out there that we want to have a mix of microhabitats there. So we're trying to accommodate that. And so far they've been very pleased with what we're doing. Uh, we do that management. And then this year they burned the whole site uh, one day. It was, that was pretty amazing. So yeah, it's, that's all I'm kind of doing now. We will, we will go and uh, rescue uh, by, we'll look for common species nests in some of the areas where we know Blandings exist and some other turtles. And we will just put down, a, uh, we built a whole bunch of uh, cages that a predator can't get at the eggs, but the turtles can get out. And it's, there's a, kind of like the corner of this, this thing right here. And there's this little place and when you go into this box we have, if you reach in and start digging in the sand, you're not going to find anything because there's a barrier in there that comes right up to the surface. And the raccoon can't reach that and dig down. So it, it's, again, it's a self-releasing turtle nest cage thing. And it's, that's been fun to, yeah. Well, we've tried different things. And uh, <laughs> anyway... Um, oh. Right. Well, there's turtles in the south that lay three clutches. Three clutches. And it's all just based on seasonal weather. So, And I would say, I think the estimate I've read is about 60% of painted turtles, females and mature females, especially if they're fully mature, they can lay two clutches, but it only represents about 60% of the painted turtles overall that would nest. <coughs> yes? <coughs> uh, I wouldn't say there's a lot. I've, you know, I spent a lot of time as a youngster in the Arboretum. And as an adult, I've done some stuff there. I tried, uh, this might sound a little crude, but I found a fresh painted nest and I urinated on it to see if it would check the nest and came back the next morning, it was dug up. I thought, well, that didn't work. <laughs> but um, there are blandings there, there aren't many. And the problem is, if you just think of that landscape, it's very hard for them to find a place. It sounds like some of the turtles go to the golf course to nest. Um, I've never seen that. I've never really paid attention to it because I'm usually during the nesting season, I'm, I'm doing something with, you know, where I'm hoping I can actually accomplish something. I can't do much in a golf course, but... Um, I think uh, some of the turtles, like painted turtles and snappers, they can nest in almost any kind of soil, whether it's clay, mixed, you know, or sandy. So there's places where they can do that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those are where the roads are, especially... No, uh, wood turtles don't exist. Um, there are probably a remnant of wood turtles using the Baraboo River. That's the farthest south that I've ever heard of turtles uh, in recent years nesting. And they're way up the Baraboo. So the lower Baraboo, I'm sure that whole system at one time was much more forested and they just moved up. So when I got a call from a guy, I was still working for the DNR. He was pretty sure that there were two, two females that were coming up to, to nest. That was kind of interesting. They also live over in Crawford County, uh, not in big numbers. I'm kind of surprised because it's so warm over there compared to a lot of the rest of the state, but 
some of the rivers are cool and they'll live in trout streams, but they also need that tanicky water. So, yeah, that I haven't done a whole lot. Um, you know, like she thought I was working in the middle of the state, and there's a whole bunch of the state that we don't address. Now, that in that interim place, I used to do a lot of work with uh, Massasauga rattlesnakes, and that was a fun project when I was working for the DNR. I did telemetry studies with them, and but they're in they're in real trouble. Uh, anyone that likes turtle meat. Uh, there's a lot of poaching that goes on, so we have restrictions in Wisconsin. Uh, basically, the turtle season is closed from, i got to get these dates right. I think, I think the, the regulations is... Uh, from the beginning of the year to the to the uh, weekend after July 4, everything's protected. Well, then there isn't much stuff going on in the state. Well, we've put limits, so you can only take in-state uh, snapping turtles. You can only take three, and you can only have six in your possession. So you can get around that pretty easy by giving three of them to your neighbor and just keep doing it. But um, but the, what we were really trying to close down, the season, and uh, excuse me, the season would run, oh, it'd run till July, but then it would shut down, not at the end of the, at the beginning of the year, it would shut down in November. The reason for that is most of the harvest was occurring during the winter when these streams that flow that are off of big waters, either the Mississippi or any other place, uh, snapping turtles congregate under banks. And these guys used to call it hooking. They would reach in there and they would snag a turtle and pull it out. And they would take out every turtle that was big enough to butcher. Well, now that's completely off limits. So it's basically closed from I believe November one all the way through uh, the July. Uh, I think it's a Saturday after July fourth, and that most of the turtles will have nested by then. Even even the double clutchers typically will be done by then. What's that? Oh, I. The only the only one I saw the one I urinated on was uh, right along the road on the south side and there was just a little pool there the lake on the other side so they would probably trans or this animal probably came into the little pool because it would be a lot warmer than the lake they kind of gestate and then laid their eggs there and I never 